Okay, it sounds like we're live, so welcome everybody, and uh, we've got our Zoom group, and we've got our YouTube group going, and uh, we'll crash right into it. So, <laughs> any, anybody have any questions to start off with? And we'll go ahead and switch to the presentation and see what we're up against for tonight. So, this is going to be the second half of Chapter 8, which is about 40 pool questions in all. And we're going to be touching a lot of really interesting subjects. That, that, that doesn't mean, well, that means that they're going to, from the 40, they're going to pull one or two or three or four questions from this chapter. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. All right, so we talked about teletype last week, and I had a couple of uh, images that I grabbed from a ham fest. There's a, a German ham, I didn't get his call sign, but... I first saw him at the Waynesville, North Carolina Ham Fest. He had all of this stuff set up and running. And first off, if you ever see any of this equipment in person, it won't look this clean. They, they've completely restored the stuff. Usually you put uh, oil and grease on it and these things are kind of a mess. So they're, they're really gorgeous, but there's uh, several flavors of teletype here. And then this one here is an actual uh, terminal teletype machine. And I've captured a little bit of uh, audio for it, so let me go ahead and run that. Let you listen. Yeah. That so proud of it. So it'll give you a little up, up close and personal view of what what they uh, were actually like. So I just wanted to share those because I didn't have them last week. So what we're going to be getting into tonight, uh, APRS uh, is something that I knew about but wasn't terribly interested in because I didn't see myself using it. But um, we'll, we'll be chatting about that some more. I was really fascinated as I got in. They've added four or five pool questions on APRS, so now we need to talk about it. And I think you'll, you'll be impressed. HF Packet, uh, a, a wonderful area. A lot of emergency communications there. PACTOR is one of the modes for packet. And then WSJTX, uh, Weak Signal Joe Taylor Experimental is what that stands for. And uh, we'll be uh, looking at a couple slides for that. And then OFDM is another protocol we'll touch on. There's some pull questions. And then there's some information on, on troubleshooting digital modes. So the first couple of slides are just some background information, no pull questions, but it's important to know that, um, and this might seem surprising, that digital voice modes are regulated as voice emissions by the FCC. Most of the digital modes actually go out on a single sideband, uh, go out like a single sideband communication in about the same space, three kilohertz. And there's a couple of um, alphabet soup items here things you've probably heard about as you've been reading catalog pages and so forth, all different flavors of, uh, of digital. And then we're going to be talking about slow scan TV. It's another image mode that's regulated as, as a voice mode. And uh, very interesting as we get into it. All of this is under the umbrella of the Federal Communications Commission, the Code of Federal Regulations, which is CFR, maximum data weight rates and bandwidths. And then you might remember this, I think back from the technician or general, digital codes other than those specified by the FCC must be public. In other words, we can't have any secret codes, um, clandestine communications, that kind of thing. It has to be public. And, of course, there were two exceptions that we, we touched on in the earlier licenses, satellite control and model planes, because uh, people think it's important that we don't bring satellites down or, or crash planes. And then we'll get into APRS a little bit. I actually found a Dave Kassler video on APRS, Automatic Packet Reporting System, and it's just amazing some of the things that this system can do. Just give you a high-level overview. Starts out with uh, today. It's usually a portable radio with a GPS receiver incorporated. It can talk to other portable radios, or it can go out to something called a digi repeater. 
and eventually get to an eye gate, which is a connection to the internet, and then via APRS.fi, you can actually see maps of everybody else who's on the system at the same time. Here's an example. So uh, we'll, we'll have some other applications come along here, but I just want to give you a high level overview of what, what the system was comprised of. And blue text again is going to be a pull question. And although it's much, much more than this, um, it is a technology used to track in real time balloons carrying amateur radio transmitters. We had a group uh, from a local university here that actually did that when we had the eclipse. We had that uh, big event. They wanted to launch a balloon in the air and then test propagation during, during, the, uh, during the eclipse. And that was just a, a fascinating project. They did it with all university students, and they used uh, APRS to track uh, where that balloon was going. Now, the, some of you may have heard of the X.25 protocol. It's a packet protocol used throughout the computer industry. The, uh, for amateur use and for use in APRS, there's something called AX25, where the A stands for amateur. So it's amateur X25. And the protocol was modified slightly so that call signs could be added to the protocol rather than just computer addressing. And they also had one other feature added. Oh, here's a link that talks about it a bit more. And when Gary sends out the, um, the, the links for our class, all of these uh, links that you'll see will be functional. So if you want to go investigate further, you can. <clears throat> and there's a pull question, that, and I think this is exactly how it's worded, the type of packet frame used to transmit APRS beacon data is unnumbered information. What in the world does that mean? I was wondering. So in, lo in looking at the standard X25, X.25 protocol, I could see that um, they used a numbering system so that packets, which uh, a lot of times a, a series of packets can be sent to convey a message from one end to the other of a communications channel, um, and they have to use the numbers to sort them out because sometimes they won't go in order after they've been routed around the country. The unnumbered version of the protocol just means that you're, you don't care where it goes. It can go any place. So if we look at our little diagram here on the screen, we've got our, our balloon. We've got somebody activating a soda site here and a little information on, on where it's going. So one of these mobiles or, or portables will be transmitting its location data to a digi, digi, digi repeater, which goes out to the, to the internet gateway, so you can see where that person is. You're not really expecting an answer back. You're just wanting to broadcast your information, which is why they can use unnumbered information. It greatly simplifies uh, collisions and so forth. So these are all things that are going to show up in pool questions. I'll give you a chance to look at those. And I was particularly interested because I, I do some summits on the air uh, chasing and I noticed that there were some um, APRS gate connections where people were spotted via APRS and that caused me to really dig in and understand how they were applying it for that purpose. A little bit more here in public service applications. The um, GPS information can show the, the position during the event. Uh, this was used a couple years ago at Hamvention in Dayton, the, the big ham fest, where they had maps of the convention site laid out, and you could tell where your friends were <laughs> by, by just looking on your phone and, and seeing where they showed up on the map. That was pretty cool. So this is during a, a, a public event. Here we've got some pictures um, of some map examples showing where people are. And this is the Appalachian Trail. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it. It goes, I think, from Maine all the way to Texas. It's a very long trail. Some people have actually hiked the whole thing, which is incredible. But you can see people who are, are on it at the time this uh, snapshot was taken. And the way that it does that is with uh, latitude and longitude data. The 
Uh, APRS has been around for about 20 years. That was before we had easy GPS uh, interfaces. People had to put in their coordinates manually. Now it's become a lot easier. And uh, Yesu and Kenwood both have radios with incorporated APRS with GPSs, so you've got everything that you need in, in one portable. There's also a standard uh, national frequency on two meters where any APRS uh, radio can connect. So just a little high-level view of APRS. Now packet modes, what we're showing here is a packet radio modem for uh, PACTOR, which stands for Packet Teletype over Radio. We'll see a lot of TOR kinds of modes. So TOR just translates to Teletype over Radio. In other words, we're sending information um, Via, via packet from one computer to another. Winmore, another term you may see. Windows messaging over radio. And this protocol, Pactor, is actually uh, proprietary. So if you wanted to get into it, you would have to buy a modem from SCS. And the last time I looked, which was today, they're about 1300 bucks. So it might not be something too many people would be interested in getting into. But if you remember the Puerto Rico disaster that we had, the, the storm, uh, some time back, there were, uh, the government was actively looking for hams that were set up this way so that they could provide uh, data communications and email from Puerto Rico with all of the sites down. No electricity, no cell sites, uh, phone systems were, were down. So it's uh, very useful in that kind of an environment. And there's several uh, exam pool references. These are just uh, mini facts. So I, I tried to put them all in one place for the purpose of being able to test at 100%. 300 baud is the most common data rate used for HF packet communications. In fact, 300 baud is the legal limit in terms of, of speed for anything below 10 meters. And therefore, I guess on HF, it would have to be the most common. This is one that Kastler commented on a little bit. Uh, the pull question uh, asks about fastest throughput under clear communications conditions. And Dave Kastler made the comment that uh, conditions are never clear and there's always fading. So in reality, this doesn't necessarily work very well, but you, you need to know this for answer, getting that pull question right. PACTOR can be used to transfer binary files on HF. That would be like uh, video files, uh, emails, that, that sort of thing. So we could replace a lot of the infrastructure that we would lose if we, were, if we had a major storm using PACTOR as the communications channel. And then there's one other thing that they'll ask, and that's keyboard to keyboard operation. Because PACTOR will translate or it, it'll transfer uh, files worth of information it's not really a keyboard to keyboard mode if we are using uh, rtty ready when you type an a at your station it shows up as an a at the station that you're you're talking to um, the same is true for uh, the the psk mode like if you're using psk uh, 41 or 31 for example that's keyboard to keyboard but pactor is entire messages There's actually four different versions of PACTOR. One is uh, very obsolete. Two, three, and four are all proprietary from SCS. And four isn't allowed uh, on the HF bands yet because its baud rate is too high. It, it's, it's higher than what the FCC limits uh, dictate. And the ARRL is trying to change that. But for the purposes of anything you'd see in ham radio, it's probably going to be PACTOR uh, two or three. This is kind of all background information here. Performs well under weak signal and high noise conditions, uh, which sometimes can be debatable if you've got a lot of fading going on. Supports binary data transfers. We've talked about that. It uses ARQ error correction. It's actually a, a hybrid of that and another kind of error correction that we'll be talking about. 
automatic repeat request just to see the concept here a r q error correction the concept there is if the message doesn't get through it'll ask that the message be resent and that's all done uh, within the within the uh, between the modems they're smart enough to do that requires an expensive proprietary modem and just like the good old days when we hooked up uh, modems to our computers to talk to uh, messaging systems like Yahoo and so forth um, they'll negotiate between the modems to pick a data rate that will be supported on both ends so it'll it'll try to communicate as quickly as possible and it'll scale back until it gets a solid channel so that's the idea here and it'll achieve a fairly high bits per second rate and of course uh, on HF we're limited at 300 baud but uh, you can get 5,000 bits per second at 300 baud with uh, the efficient use of the protocol which this provides some notes um, these are kind of troubleshooting notes things to be aware of as you're getting into digital digital is very severely uh, affected by distortion and the, the big one is do not overdrive the transmitter and I'll have some uh, images in a minute of what that looks like if if a transmitter is overdriven and I think we might have talked about ALC in a previous class um, ALC stands for automatic level control and a single sideband transmitter the way that it protects itself from being overdriven if you put too much audio into a sideband transmitter uh, it will eventually stop increasing power and cut back the audio level so that you can't burn out the final amplifiers in, in, the, um, in, the, in the transceiver of course it even becomes more severe if you've got a high power amplifier the high power amplifiers will provide that feedback too it says oh no you're driving me too hard I'm going to turn down the audio well that, that causes the audio to be nonlinear and creates distortion which adversely affects the digital modes so recommended that you don't use any speech processing no compression and you can check your signal by transmitting into a dummy load and or, or calling a friend saying I'm going to be testing this tell me if I've got clean clean signals and if they've got a spectrum display and a waterfall they, they can look at what you're sending and tell you if it's clean or not so these are just all things to be aware of uh, in a practical sense all right now possible reasons for an unsuccessful contact and we're talking digital modes your transmit frequency is incorrect and what that means is you're decoding somebody but you can't uh, return to them so that this is a possibility the protocols have to be exactly the same on both ends or you're not going to be communicating and it's possible that a station you can't hear is using the frequency because of skip they might be interfering with the person you're talking to but you, you can't hear them at all so sometimes you just have to try different different approaches then finally you can be on the wrong sideband we'll be mentioning this a little bit later but using uh, uh, FT8 and those kinds of modes those all transmit on upper sideband uh, RTTY typically transmits on lower sideband and I did an experiment today I tuned to uh, in one of the FT8 frequencies and it was just loaded it was on 40 meters it was just packed with signals and it, that was upper sideband then I switched my radio to lower sideband and heard absolutely nothing except for one RTTY station <laughs> So it, it, it's really effective if you're on the wrong sideband and somebody's communicating uh, on the opposite one, you, you're not going to hear them. And that gets a little confusing because different digital modes use uh, different uh, standards for sidebands. We'll mention some of those. Now the first thing I did here, I put up, uh, I found a couple of pictures uh, on the internet and put on the word eek. These are, are horrible. This, this is a signal that you can see is splattering off both sides probably interfering with somebody next to them this signal should be about this wide and you can see all of this stuff hanging off the sides here so 
this is probably a case of severe audio distortion uh, and what it looks like on the air. And here's where you can ask a friend to, to look at your signal or you can use another transceiver and, and look yourself. Common cause for audio frequency shift keying signals, that's where we're putting tones into the mic input of a transceiver and transmitting them out on the air, audio frequency shift keying. Common cause of overmodulation is excessive transmit audio levels. And this is what they would probably look like. Now, intermodulation distortion, a lot of the um, software that runs these modes has, actually has an indicator to, that will measure intermod distortion. So that'd be something worth, worth looking at. But intermodulation distortion, or IMD, is a parameter that evaluates the distortion of the signal caused by excessive audio. It's something you can check out. And then there's kind of an oddball question here for an idling PSK signal. Remember, we can have audio frequency shift keying or phase shift keying that will pretty much generate the same result if the levels are set right. But the way the pool question is, list is worded, it says uh, for an idling PSK signal, and then they give a maximum uh, level of, of minus 30, which happens to be the, the smallest value in the, in the answers. We'll see that. So these are things that you will see again. And then we'll get into our, our friend Joe Taylor. He's an absolutely fascinating guy. This is a link to their site where all of this stuff is available. These are things you may have heard about, protocols or modes. We've got FT4, FT8. Uh, JT65 was one of the earlier modes that, that came out, uh, I think, over 10 years ago. It's been around a long time. You've probably heard of Whisper. An echo is a mode for sending a signal to, to the moon and then seeing how well you can hear yourself when it bounces back. Dave, are most of those upper sideband? Yes. Okay, so it's just the RIDI that's lower sideband. Yep, exactly. So okay. uh, the, the modes that you'll probably actually use are FT4 and FT8, and some of these other ones are, are more for specialty, specialty applications. These were designed for moon bounce, but JT65, when it came out, became very popular on, on the HF bands. FT8 and FT4 are the ones that are most popular today, with FT8 being the clear winner. FT4 is just a faster version of FT8, really designed for contesting. And there's even a mode designed for meteor scatter. We're going to be looking at meteor scatter and moon bounce when we get into the propagation chapter, which is chapter 10. So the next two weeks, Gary will be talking about an antennas. That's a, a really big chapter and an important one. And then I'll be getting into propagation and we'll, we'll be circling back to um, moon bounce and meteor scatter. Fascinating modes. And there's a, a presentation here that would really be worth watching. It's about 80 minutes long. So it, it'll, it would be a little investment in, in time. But Joe Taylor, he's a Nobel laureate and uh, astrophysicist. He's a pretty smart guy. Uh, but this, this was from his presentation, which is here if you want to see it. And th this is really interesting. Single sideband, in order to communicate between you and your friend across the country, you need to be about 10 dB above the noise. CW, which uh, he terms ear and brain, because that's where you're decoding it, uh, CW about 15 dB below the noise. And look at the difference between minus 15 and plus 10. That's 25 dB, which, which is incredible. So one watt of CW is worth way more than 100 watts in single sideband, which is why a lot of the QRP people that do summits on the air are primarily CW because they're all running QRP, low power. So to, to me this was amazing but then it becomes even more amazing when you get into the modes that are with that he helped to design. JT65 you can be 25 dB below noise and some of the other ones are, are even more dramatic. Uh, whisper minus 31. So you can be uh, 
having a contact with somebody across the country or across the world and you cannot even hear the signal on your receiver but the software can. So that has really revolutionized communications uh, for, for weak signal and it's been a, a, a boon to those of us who have been down in the dumps because of uh, the, the sunspot, uh, you know, the, the minimums in the solar cycle because you can actually carry on with uh, and make a lot of contacts this way. They're minimal contacts, it's just a call sign and a signal report, but it's still fun to work somebody in New Zealand or Australia when you can't talk to anybody any other way. So this, to me, this, this chart was just really interesting. And I do recommend this presentation if you have time to, to look at it. So here's some characteristics. As we indicated in the chart, many of these modes will provide communications decoding way below the noise level. And they use a concept called forward error correction, or FEC. They send a lot of redundant data during their transmission that helps uh, the receiving end to recover data that might be garbled. More on that is coming. And here's something from a pool question. JT65 uses multi-tone audio frequency shift keying in AFK, AFSK mode. So we're sending tones to our transmitter. And the reason it's called JT65 is because there's four tones plus a synchronizing tone. So it's shifting back and forth between all of these tones to send its data. In FT4, uh, which is a newer version, well, FT8 came out and took the ham world by storm. Then FT4 came out as a, more of a contesting mode. With FT8, it, it's a 15-second cycle. With FT4, it's 7.5 seconds, so it's twice as fast. That doesn't mean you can make a contact that quickly because uh, there's a sequence of about four uh, events that it rolls through. You're calling CQ on FT8, for example, and then if somebody wants to answer you, um, they'll send their call sign and a signal report. You'll send a signal report back to them, and then you'll finally say, yeah, I got you, 73, we're all happy. So it takes about four cycles to complete the, the, the entire contact, and that's all handled automatically within the computer software, and you can kind of see them going by. It's a lot of fun. I've, I've got thousands of contacts on, on FT8 and have, have really enjoyed that during the little sunspot cycle that we're in. So again, note, note the blue things here. And then there's something, and I, I just had to love Dave Kastler here because when he gets into something that's really technical, he, had a, um, he said, I, I, the engineer in me wants to tell you this. And then he kind of goes off on a, on a tangent. <laughs> So this, this gets really, it can get really, really complicated. What they're showing here is uh, some signaling down at the bottom. And then these are actually subcarriers, these different colors. And you can see that they've chosen, we've got sinusoidal data pulses, which we talked about a little bit last week. Um, and then they're putting uh, subcarriers in between each other here. So then get a lot of things going on at the same time. So it's really a method or designed for high, um, very high speed digital modes. And some of those are used in ham radio. And under the covers, it's a digital modulation technique using subcarriers at frequencies chosen to avoid inter symbol interference. And you can, uh, excuse me, you can kind of see how that's working here as these are, are tucked in between other carriers. So these are the only two facts you need to know about orthogonal frequency division multiplex you don't even need to have, you don't even need to know how to spell it so that's a good thing and then we'll see how we can do here what technology is used to track in real time balloons carrying amateur radio transmitters early that's our friend APRS automated a reporting system, packet reporting system. Charlie. Yep, you got it. What digital protocol is used by APRS? Charlie. Charlie. That's Charlie. I wonder why these are all Charlie. We'll see if that <laughs> continues here. That's Amateur X25. What kind of packet frame is used 
to transmit the beacon data. Alpha. 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 That's unnumbered information. And how can we help support public service? Charlie? I'm guessing yes. it's C. <laughs> I'm guessing it's C. We're going to get to the point where if uh, we can't figure it out, we're just going to say C. But be aware, be aware that um, the these answers may not be in the same order when you get to your test. So don't just remember C. You'll have to read. And how does APRS communicate station location? Delta. Yep, latitude and longitude with GPS receivers. What is the most common data rate used for HF packet? Charlie. It's another Charlie, which is also the max limit. Which of these has the fastest throughput under clear communications channels? PSK31. Um, Delta. No, it was Delta, 300 baud packet. And that's the one that, uh, that Kastler com commented on. 300 baud packet, if everything is perfect. Remember, packet is stringing a whole bunch of data together, and that, that's how it gets the higher throughput. You don't have to be typing as fast as you can go. It's all going computer to computer. Which of these digital modes does not support keyboard to keyboard operation? Alpha? Yes, which is also the, one of the reasons why it um, gives you the highest throughput, because it's all um, combined into packets, multiple packets. Now, which mode can transfer binary files? Which is also, the, re which is also the reason that it isn't a keyboard to keyboard mode. Well, that's, that's Pactor again. That's why they wanted uh, hams with, Pac uh, excuse me, Pactor equipped hams to go to Puerto Rico when they were in trouble and other disaster sites around the US. What type of modulation is used for JT65? He went past this one kind of alpha. quickly. It's alpha. Multitone AFSK JT65 has got 65 tones, if that helps you with the answer. What, how is the timing of FT4 contacts organized? Charlie. That's Charlie again. FT8 is 15 seconds. FT4 is half of that. And our friend orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. What kind of communications? Alpha. Yes. High speed digital. And how does it work? I guess is the way the you could interpret the question. Alpha? Well, actually I didn't was that an alpha or a delta I heard? It was an alpha you heard, but delta is right, yeah. Ah, okay. You meant to say delta. Oh, you did, did you? Okay, all right. I believe you. you use the subcarriers. The non-harmonically related frequencies, you remember where we heard that before? That, that was the 210 two-tone test we used for checking the linearity of single sideband transmitters, which is not the answer in this case. Which of the following is a possible reason that attempts to initiate contact may fail? Read carefully. Delta. Del yep, it is all of the above. All these choices are correct. Common cause of overmodulation for audio frequency shift keying signals. Delta. Yes, excessive transmit levels. So you start low and slowly bring it up. What parameter evaluates distortion? For an AFSK signal. Mm. Delta? Delta, yep, intermodulation distortion. Because if we're uh, running it too hard, we'll be creating uh, intermod. That's delta. Which is delta. Yep. Too much level means distortion, and that's the only answer with distortion in it. What is considered an acceptable maximum intermod uh, level? For an idling PSK signal? Alpha. Okay, it's not alpha. Delta. Yeah, you, you want the, the, the minimum amount possible, which is the minus 30. 
right? And we'll just touch a little bit on spread spectrum. Another fascinating concept that you probably won't use. Um, well, you, you could. I'll, I'll tell you where. Spread spectrum comes in four flavors. We just have two of the flavors that are used in ham radio. And the concept is to spread a signal over a very wide bandwidth. So we're going to cause it to jump all over the place. And that will make it very hard to decode by somebody that doesn't have the right software. Um, and it will also make it immune to, to noise. And we'll share some of the reasons why. So the idea is to spread the signal over a very wide bandwidth. This can only be used on the, the higher frequencies. We can't use it on HF. So we're going to uh, vary the frequency in a predefined sequence. And because we're diluting the signal across many frequencies, it makes it sound like noise to a conventional receiver. And it, it could be below the noise floor. So it's very possible people wouldn't even be able to hear that signal if they were listening on a conventional receiver. It's resistant to interference because signals not using the, the secret code, the spread spectrum algorithm, are suppressed in the receiver because they don't match on both ends. I'm going to switch to a bigger picture of this. So here's the noise level. And this might be a CW or a sideband signal sticking way up above the noise level. The spread spectrum signal, though, because its energy is spread out over a much broader range, can actually be running below the noise level. So signals that don't have, that either have a different spreading code or um, are, are not spread spectrum wouldn't be able to interpret the spread spectrum signal. And it's resistant to interference because these other signals won't interfere with it. And then um, here's an interesting fact. Many spread spectrum systems can share frequencies by using different spreading codes. And uh, Dave Kessler had mentioned code division multiple uh, access in an earlier video called CDMA. This is something that is uh, used in, in cellular. If you've got different codes going, you can actually have multiple conversations on the same channel at the same time, and they won't hear each other. The picture we saw. And I mentioned that there were four flavors, and you can read more about this on Wikipedia. There's two that we use in ham radio. There's frequency hopping and direct sequence. So it's frequency hopping, spread spectrum, direct sequence spread, spread, spread spectrum. This is the easiest one to understand, frequency hopping, is what we're doing is we're jumping uh, all over the place, uh, going from one frequency to another frequency to another frequency very rapidly. Nobody would ever be able to figure out any, any part of the communication unless they had any, a receiver equipped and it knew the code. So the frequency of the transmitted signal has changed very rapidly according to a pseudo-random sequence also used by the receiving station. It's not random at all because they both have to know it, but it would appear random to anybody trying to figure it out. And uh, Kassler had a real nice diagram of uh, how that worked, how they take a one and a zero, chop it up into multiple, multiple um, chips, and then they can compare all of those and average them to determine if it's a one or a zero. So that's uh, some, some background there if you want to go a little deeper. And then direct sequence uses a high-speed binary bit stream to shift the phase of the RF carrier. Here we're actually changing the frequency. Here we're changing the phase. So if you can remember what the frequency hopping concept is, that will help decode the, this question because it's, this one is not frequency hopping. <laughs> The other two are called time hopping and chirp SS. We don't use those in amateur radio, but they are described in Wikipedia if you want to know what the other two flavors are. Then here's a diagram. It's showing frequency hopping all over the place. Here's number one, hop number 12, hop number 58. This is frequency um, hopping spread spectrum, FHSS. And we saw these words before. 
And then the, the other flavor uh, is, is diagrammed here in, in red. It's the other flavor that we see is the, the uh, direct sequence spread spectrum. Now an application of spread spectrum is um, something that you're familiar with as, as Wi-Fi. There's several uh, pool questions that talk about mesh networks. Mesh networks are basically uh, a number, several modems in a small area, like you could have these in your home. If we stick to the Wi-Fi example, um, they, they can talk to each other and form what's called a, a mesh network. So that'll be synonymous with, um, if you can remember the Wi-Fi con concept, that, that'll help. There's a book available. The Kindle version of this is only 10 bucks, and it's dated. It's about 10 years old now, but it's about the only thing out there that really gives a, a lot of background on it. So you can actually set up your own ham version of, of an internet if you'd like. And a benefit is that you can use higher power than standard Wi-Fi. Standard Wi-Fi can be up to a watt. We are allowed to use 10 watts PEP, peak envelope power. And there's something magic about peak envelope power uh, versus effective radiated power. If, you, if you're allowed to have 10 watts PEP, that means you'll have 10 watts coming out of your transmitter. If you put that into a, a 10 dB gain antenna, that 10 watts uh, gets multiplied times 10. So you could cover an entire city with your own Wi-Fi network if you wanted to as a, as a ham. Isn't that amazing? And for emergency communications, you could set up an alternate Wi-Fi that covers a fairly large area. This is something you can do as a ham. So how's the Wi-Fi in your house, Dave? Um, I just have a conventional modem. I don't have anything crazy. I, I'm not using this technology as, as a ham. Okay but it's available. And frequency... Well, would that be used to expand your regular Wi-Fi internet access? Or is it no, you network? can't link them together. Yes, yes. It uses the same frequencies, um, but you have to have custom or special firmware in the router. In fact, you, you can get uh, commercial routers and change the firmware to make this all work as, as a ham. But then you, you can't use that to... yeah. Right, Gary's answer was absolutely correct. So there are portions of the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi band that uh, overlap with some of the ham bands. That's why we can use uh, commercial products that are modified to make this work. But it would be like sending data from computer to computer just within a private network? Exactly right, yep. So anything you could do on Wi-Fi, uh, transfer files, um, just any monitors, security cameras. Uh, of course, we've got the FCC regulations where we have to identify ourselves every 10 minutes and all of that still applies. <clears throat> but yeah, okay. anything you can do on Wi-Fi, you, you can do on a ham mesh network with, with your own private Wi-Fi if you want to look at it that way. And this, this book goes into all of the things that you uh, would need to concern yourself on a Wi-Fi network, uh, DHP, DHCP protocols and uh, all of the discovery stuff that goes on and uh, net networking concepts. It's just all uh, the, something that's ham specific. So we can use a wireless router running custom firmware. And individual nodes from a mesh network or form a mesh network by using discovery and link estab establishment protocols. This isn't the same as the automatic link establishment concept that we talked about before. These are link establishment with, within the Wi-Fi world. So kind of make yourself a mental snapshot of, of the blue text here. Then we'll get into data or error detection and correction. And look, look at this poor guy over here. Have you, have you ever put together a 500 piece puzzle and you couldn't find one of the pieces? Doesn't that just make you nuts? We, we just did that at our house, and uh, we've got a couple of uh, grandsons. Uh, and, well, it's my, my daughter and her, her family that are staying with us, and they enjoy doing jigsaw puzzles. And we found three pieces that had fallen off the table and were under, underneath something, so that, that solved our problem. But what good is data if it's corrupted? Very frustrating. 
Well, first of all, realize that RTTY and PSK31 have no error detection or correction whatsoever. But with uh, those modes, you can just ask the person to resend, you know. That works. For ASCII, we talked about parity bits. They can detect single bit errors. There's something called a CRC, Cyclic Redundancy Check, that can detect multi-bit errors, and we'll have a diagram coming up on that. And then ARQ, remember we talked about this just a little bit earlier, Automatic Repeat Request, how ARQ accomplishes error correction if errors are detected, a retransmission is requested. So there's a couple of ways we can do error correction, and that's one of them. ARQ, we can see where the, the letters come from, automatic, repeat, request. And if a, a packet comes through correctly, some modes will send an ACK, which is an acknowledgement. Or if they don't receive it correctly, they'll send a NAC, which is not acknowledged. That's all part of the automatic repeat request framework. So, how do we get this piece back in the puzzle? It's the thing we're going to consider next. Well, first of all, forward error correction. It's possible to add additional data, or really redundant data, with the original packet to help correct errors. So if you sense that there's an error, there may be enough information in the packet to fix that. The uh, FT modes, FT8, uh, uh, JT65 use extensive forward error correction to get their, their signals through. It's implemented by transmitting extra data or redundant data that may be used to detect and correct transmission errors. And there's many kinds of, of codes. Reed Solomon is the one that, that's used by FT8 and JT65. However, if the error threshold is exceeded, there's too much uh, distortion there or too many missing, missing bits, the protocol will just give up. Data, on, data becomes unrecoverable once the, the error rate exceeds the correction threshold. And then this is something that Kastler uh, commented on about as, as well. And when I kind of saw what they were getting at in terms of how it worked, I made the decision that I really didn't want to understand that very much. <laughs> and since there's no pull questions, you don't need to. But just be aware that there, there is something called Viterbi encoding that uh, is very sophisticated, and it does a wonderful job of uh, detecting and correcting errors. This was from Kessler, and I, I thought it was excellent, so I wanted to just kind of walk through it. Forward error correction sends data with a bigger checksum. Well, let's see what that means. So in a, in a typical packet, there's going to be a header, which may have information about where the packet is supposed to go. Then it's got what's called the payload. That's the information that you actually want to send somebody, which could be as long as an email message. Then it's got a checksum. Now this checksum can actually be pretty sophisticated. It's not just necessarily adding up all the, the values of all of the letters that you're, you're sending, converting the, uh, the alphanumerics into numbers and adding them up, does some pretty sophisticated things to verify that what was sent is correct. So it does that on the sending side. Um, using an algorithm, sometimes uh, you know, CRC is one, the cyclic redundancy check. So this checksum is what we're sending with the packet to say, okay, this is, you have this now on the receiving end to see if the data is correct. So on the receiving end, you look at it, does the checksum match? If yes, then fine, you'll go on to the next packet. If no, then it goes through a process that says, well, do I have enough redundant data where I can fix this missing data? And if so, it takes it and it's, and it's happy. If not, then in some modes, some protocols, it'll actually ask for a, a, a resend. So it doesn't go through that complicated process of trying to rebuild it in, unless the checksum is wrong. Now the automatic repeat request, that has a simpler check. Same thing, header, this is the message payload, and a check. And if it's correct, then it'll just go on and decode the next one. 
If it's not correct, then it will flat out ask for a resend. So that's the automatic repeat request. So we, we kind of had two here. We had the forward error correction method and we had the automatic repeat request method. And into some questions. Why are received spread spectrum signals resistant to interference? Alpha? That's correct. Alpha. Yep, it is alpha. If the other side doesn't have the algorithm, it will not understand them. It will not understand the message. What spread spectrum communications technique uses high speed binary bitstream to shift the phase of an RF carrier? Remember, we talked about two flavors. We talked about frequency hopping. Bravo. Direct sequence was the other one. Correct. So if you get stuck here, just think, if, if this isn't frequency hopping, then it must be the other one. So you have to be a little careful because they do give you both of, uh, you know, they give you a plausible answer here if you're, if you're not sure of it. But because there wasn't any frequency hopping in the question, you know it can't be that, it's got to be this. So how does frequency hopping work? A lot of words to read there. Delta. It is delta. Had to make you read all the way to the bottom, didn't I? <laughs> the frequency of the transmitted signal has changed very rapidly according to a pseudo-random sequence. Which of the following frequencies are sometimes used for amateur radio mesh networks? Bravo. Yep, that's uh, one place. They, there's other frequencies that you can use. Uh, nothing in the HF bands, but uh, at, at UHF and above, you have a lot of options. What type of equipment is commonly used to implement a mesh network? Charlie? Charlie. Right. Wireless router, just a standard commercial router with, with custom firmware. And there's websites and uh, amateur resources and the, the book that I showed you on mesh networks that gives you sources for all of that, should you want to play with it. What technique do individual nodes use to form a mesh network? Charlie. Yes, they have to discover one another and, uh, and, and link. Get the message through the network. What is what do the letters F E C mean? This is kind of a gimme, I think. Alpha. Yes, forward error correction. Now, how do we implement forward error correction? How does it work? Early again. Yep. That's the redundant data, extra data detect if there is an error and if it detects an error it tries to fix it before asking for a, a resend. How does ARQ work? Uh, Delta. Delta, exactly. And this would be an ideal time for a break. Amateur television is the last um, big area that we'll cover tonight and there are several flavors. There's uh, uh, what's called fast scan TV ATV. ATV is sometimes called ancient TV. <laughs> and we'll talk about the reasons for that because the standards go back to the 40s and, and 50s. And then we'll touch a little bit on, um, I think we just have a couple comments on digital TV, but the, the lion's share of this section will be on, on analog television. And then we'll be talking about slow scan TV, which is something that you might actually want to try using sometime. So we'll go ahead and take a break at this time and and come back in five minutes. Go do something fun. Not that this wasn't.
Okay, we were just uh, chatting during the break about old obsolete equipment that turned out to be valuable. And some people can't believe that you can actually sell some of this stuff and there's a demand for it. What we're going to be talking about next with amateur TV, because the standards go back to the 40s and 50s, uh, you can actually use some of this older TV equipment in, uh, for, for amateur TV. I'll tell you something up front though, if you want to play around with the fast scan amateur TV, which is the older technology, um, you better make sure that you've got people in your area that are also doing it <laughs> or you won't have anybody to talk to. So in the major metro areas, there, there might be some uh, amateur TV activity going on. I think there's some in St. Louis, there's a group over there that, that, that does a bunch of that, probably Chicago. So if, if you wanted to get into that, just make sure that, that it's supported by a local club. Plus, you'll need a, a mentor probably to help get into it. So with that, let's um, go ahead and give us a look here. Fast Scan TV is the first thing we'll be talking about. And this started out with the National Television System Committee in 1941, NTSC. So when people talk about NTSC video, they're, they're talking about the analog standards that, that we're going to be discussing here over the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes. The, uh, it's, it's old technology, but it still works. It's what all black and white TV was prior to 1953. And then in 1953, color was added. And before we had the digital standards and HDMI and uh, all of that, this was the only TV that was available to us. So most of you probably were using these technologies in your younger years without even being aware of it. There was a standard added in 53 called NTSC RS-170, which was the technical standard for, for adding color, color TV, which was really cool at the time. Mm. Now, because the amateur fast scan TV is using this technology, uh, old TV sets can still be used, and there might be a demand for some of that stuff if you haven't gotten rid of it all already. So amateur television fast scan, as used in the current exam pool, uses these NTSC standards. So we'll be going through it. There's quite a few pool questions. That's why we're looking at some of this older stuff. But digital amateur TV is really our future, and there's an excellent website here that you can access if you wanted to investigate that. So this is what we need for a fast scan system. We need a TV camera of some sort, a microphone, a transmitter, and this can only happen at 70 centimeters and above, 440 megahertz, because the signals are very wide. It's like six megahertz wide. Wow. Optional power amplifier, gain antenna, and, and one of our good old fashion TV sets here. So amateur television is a technique or a technique that allows commercial analog TV receivers to be used on the 70 centimeter band transmitting on channels shared with cable TV because uh, these a lot of these old TV sets would uh, operate uh, on cable uh, that's that's why we can use them because some of the amateur frequencies overlap. Talk about how we get the video signal. It's, uh, Kessler's comment was that it's really ingenious how they came up with all of this stuff, and I'd have to agree. What we're actually doing is scanning. This is an electron beam that, that's, that's scanning, and it's uh, going across the screen left to right, and then there's a blanking signal that turns off the beam snaps back over to the left, and it, it goes on down. So the very first scan that occurs starts at the upper left, and then it zigzags back up to the top, like this. And then you see this scan starts in the middle. So what we're doing here with this technology is we're doing two complete scans of, of the video picture, combining uh, those scans into one overall frame. This is happening uh, once every 30 seconds, 30th of or a second. 30th of a second, right? So we're completing one scan, um, or completing those two scans in, in a 30th of a second. Got my math tangled up there. <laughs> Gary was actually involved in uh, 
commercial broadcast, so he's going to be jumping in here from time to time, which I appreciate. So this is an example. Uh, we're going to walk you through how we're going to take a, a picture of this using this technology. This is what we're going to be creating. So we're going to start out by scanning one line, and here's an example of a line that we're going to be scanning. Notice that we've got a white level and a black level. I'm scanning this line. And notice that this is kind of light colored here, so between white and black, and we're considering it in, in black and white, we haven't really added color yet, but notice that this is lighter, so we're going to be somewhere between the white and black levels. This part of the scan, notice that there's some, some highlights in it, so the signal is going to be jumping up and down. This one's fairly dark, so we're going to have more of the black component, or the darker component, grayscale. Here we're going from dark to light, you see the signal jump up, and so forth and so on, all the way across. So what we've just managed to do is convert this light signal into a waveform, an analog waveform. Well, that seems fairly useless at this point. Hmm. But we're going to do it over and over again. We're going to move down the image and capture them in sequence. So we're going to do 262 and a half scans for each field, 525 for each frame. That's the odd, odds and the evens. So here's the odds. 1, 3, 5, etc. So we got half the picture. Now we're going to do it again. We're going to start all over again and we're going to get the evens. If we've got all of the odds and all of the evens, we have now captured the complete image. So 30 odd fields per second, 30 even fields per second, winds up with 30 frames per second. We've got a complete picture. Okay, continuing the discussion. NTSC is the technology we're talking about. And interlaced, and, and that process of combining even and odd is called interlacing. So interlaced scanning pattern is generated by scanning odd on one field and even in the next. Here's a sample of the sawtooth wave that, that's driving the electron beam. And we saw this in a, in a previous slide, but here it is in terms of the pool question. 525 horizontal lines make up a fast scan or NTSC television frame. The evens plus the odds. And 30 frames, which is the complete picture per second, is transmitted in the fast scan system. I know this is a little bit redundant, but I'm trying to get it in terms of, of the pool questions. Here's a little bit deeper level. There's an organization called the Institute of Radio Engineers, IRE, and they define signal levels in units called IRE uh, levels or units. So that this is kind of what uh, we talked about the, in this section right here is where we're, we're doing the scanning, the active video. And there's sync pulses that happen before and after that. You see that uh, here we've got uh, black. Black level is 7.5 IRE, IRE units. The white level is 100 IRE. This corresponds roughly to about 1 volt, 0 to 1 volt if that's easier for you to, to, to visualize. And then there's a term that you may hear called blacker than black. The blanking uh, pulses or the, the, and the sync pulses happen below the black level. That's why they're called blacker than black. Get a relative idea of the timing. And here's a few more definitions. We already see, saw that the, the field rate 60 times per second, the frame rate, horizontal lines. We haven't talked about the sound subcarrier, but what good would a movie be if you could only see the picture and couldn't hear the sound? 
and the total channel bandwidth is 6 megahertz, which is really, really wide. Hey, what, how does this play into the old vertical hold button or dial on a TV? Well, does that, that have anything to do with the interlacing? Not really the interlacing, but uh, the, the vertical hold will make sure that the TV is synced so that uh, the, the, the rate of, of the complete uh, frames matches what the TV is um, synced to. And but, if you, you lose one of those uh, blacker than black sync signals, mm -hmm. if for some reason yes. uh, there's interference or whatnot, mm -hmm. that could cause your TV uh, to start rolling as mm -hmm. well. Usually though, rolling in the TV was because of capacitors that were going bad inside. Ah, okay. I, I do have a story that you're probably interested in. Um, there, of course, TV repairmen were, were in very much demand back then because most of the TVs had tubes in them and they were repairable. Usually you'd have to change tubes. Uh, that, was, that was a big thing you had to do. And the drugstores used to have tube testers in them and you could actually go to the drugstore and test the tubes in your TV and, and buy tubes. Uh, but an, an, another story from those days, that one of the TV repairmen was... Uh, visiting uh, an elderly lady who was very, very fussy about her picture. She, it just didn't quite look right to her. So this, this enterprising repair person said, well, uh, I, I know what we can do. So he went back to the TV and turned the vertical hold. So the picture started flipping slowly. Said, I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of pictures and when you see the one you want, tell me and I'll stop it right there. Huh. So that, that, that was his solution. <laughs> I guess it worked, I don't know. Oh, oh, oh. oh, clever. So we'll, we'll get back here um, to our presentation. So color was, was added a little bit later. And the name of the signal component that carries color in NTSC video is called chroma. And I have kind of a dumb way of, of remembering that. Um, with 35 millimeter cameras, one of the best films you could get was Kodachrome. So I, I, I associate that with, with chroma or, or color. So if that helps you, terrific. If not, think of a different way. So these numbers are very, very similar. They had to adjust the field and frame rates just slightly to make everything fit with, with the color. We'll show you some pictures of that coming up. So we see that the field rate, frame rate, and horizontal lines are just slightly different, but not enough so that a black and white TV couldn't interpret the signal. There's something called a color subcarrier that is used in a color TV. The sound subcarrier is the same between black and white and color. That's running at 4.5 megahertz. There's actually, uh, that's, that's modulated, it's a frequency modulated signal. And the total channel bandwidth is six megahertz for both color and black and white. And here's some how does it work kind of uh, information. This is just uh, general information, but I, I find it to be very interesting. And there are some cool questions relating to some of this. Notice, first of all, that there's a guard band. It keeps the channels from running into each other and interfering with each other. There's something called a luma car uh, carrier. What's happening here is the luminance or the black and white information. Remember, we were scanning those, those lines and creating uh, 525 of them. Well, this uh, luminance is really the, the black and white component of the signal, which is transmitted uh, amplitude, it's amplitude modulated. The carrier is here, and what's being transmitted is just the carrier and all of the upper sideband. Now, some of the lower sideband is cut off. So there's just a, a vestige of that sideband, the lower sideband, which isn't really needed. This is called vestigial sideband. Now the chroma information or color, that's on a carrier that's 3.5, this big long number above the luma character or carrier. And notice that's also a vestigial sideband, except they're uh, maintaining the lower sideband here and attenuating the, the upper. And here's the, that audio carrier I was telling you about, which is 4.5 4 megahertz above the luma character, the carrier. And audio is FM. Audio is FM, correct. So the total bandwidth of a channel is six megahertz. Here's a little bit more on, on how the signal would look and technicians would hook their oscilloscope up and examine the video and 
um, help troubleshoot issues that, that showed up there. In the case of color, well, let, let's look at this sync pulse here. We've got a sync pulse and another sync pulse, and then some terminology. The very small portion before the sync pulse was referred to as the front porch. The little part behind the sync pulse is a back porch, and then there's a what's called a chroma burst that's happening at this uh, 3.57 megahertz rate, and that helps to synchronize the chroma carrier. Keep it where it belongs. And then uh, I learned something from Gary, I think last time we talked this, N NTSC, that, that actually stands for something. Never twice the same color. Yeah, <laughs> so there was a little instability there. <laughs> the uh, human eye tends to notice changes in intensity uh, quicker than they do in terms of color errors. But this, this was frustrating to the broadcast engineers because it was very difficult to get it to be repeatable. But it, it worked fabulously. If you ever watch color TV before digital, I mean, it, it, it can be pretty respectable. And Dave, while you have this waveform up, I just thought mm -hmm. I'd make a comment that when the um, actual AM transmitter, the TV transmitter, mm -hmm. is used, this waveform on the top mm -hmm. is actually transmitted upside down. Yes. The sync pulses are the highest output power from the transmitter, mm -hmm. and white level is the lowest output power from the transmitter because they wanted the sync pulses to get maximum power so that your TV set would remain locked. Yes, because you don't want your uh, the vertical hold or the horizontal, you know, going all over the place. So they'd maximize the power into into these sync pulses by inverting the uh, the waveform, which is easy to to bring back on the other side. So here's all of the relationships that are taking place there. We uh, covered the concept of vestigial sideband, and here it is in terms of the pool questions. Vestigial sideband is amplitude modulation in which one complete sideband and a portion of the other are transmitted. We see a picture of that down here. This is the video carrier. The complete upper sideband, but the lower one is, is, is filtered out which matches the words here. So the use of vestigial sideband with analog to fast scan TV, uh, why, why did they want to do that? Well, it reduces the bandwidth because they've cut off a big part of it here. And it allows for simple video detector circuitry. You might remember for an AM signal, all you need to detect it is really a, a diode. So that, that's a fairly simple method of recovering the information, which is what, what makes this true. Reduced bandwidth, simple video detector circuitry made it made this method attractive. It became part of the standard. And uh, this was what Gary was alluding to here: needing a stable picture even with very weak analog signals. They invert the the waveform so the signal pulses, the sync pulses are the strongest being transmitted. We invert the signal for transmission. And with color, they're, they're using um, some of the lines for other purposes. And in our case, we can only use this at 6 megahertz or UHF and above because of the wide signal. It's actually the uh, 70 centimeter, 440 megahertz band or above. And while you have this uh, slide up, I'll just mm -hmm. comment on uh, current HD TV. Uh, you'll see sometimes that standard definition signals are described as being 480 lines. Mm -hmm. Notice 483. That 480 indicates the active lines. So a 480i or interlace signal is the same as an old uh, analog NTSC signal. Wow, I didn't know that. That's cool. So that, that was just background information there. Tie some of this together. Getting into a, another concept here. We, we saw what the, uh, the luminance, the, the black and white video information was there. And then for color, we have hue and saturation. There's really three different signals going on there. And then the way that that uh, gets combined into a signal, here's a frequency domain picture uh, or display. 
15,750 scan lines per second. Spectrum that looks like a comb. We're going to talk about comb filters in just a minute. You might have heard of. That was a big marketing thing amongst different TV brands. And for black and white, there's nothing in between these peaks. Here's our picture carrier frequency and the uh, spectrum display coming up. So what in the world could we use all of these empty spaces for? I'm sure you're wondering that. Well, that's where we can put the color information. So the um, saturation and, and hue, we saw that the gray was the black and white information. Then we can interleave the color information. And if, if we have it synced up properly, um, everything will be happy. The idea of a comb filter was to, to keep these out of each other's hair. No pun intended. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Gary liked that one. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it combed the information out so that you could separate these. So the, just another picture of, of how this is working, conceptual idea. I'm slotting we're the gonna need, We're going to need someone to do a drum roll for you, Dave. Yeah, right, yeah. Everyone. So that one just came to me. Unbelievable. Yeah, I agree. So it's kind of important that you be able to hear. Um, we were talking about needing audio before. So with NTSC, we're using a, a subcarrier 4.5 megahertz above the video carrier for audio. And we can do the same thing with amateur TV, but it's actually a little bit more common to use a separate VHF or UHF audio link or you could frequency modulate the, the video carrier. That's another method that is, is used in amateur uh, fast scan TV. So these are just some of the, the, the methods that can be used to get audio so that we can hear. So here's a, a, just a repeat of the overall system, TV camera, transceiver, amplifier antenna, and a TV set. And we'll see how we do on the questions. What technique allows commercial analog TV receivers to be used for fast scan TV operations on the 70 centimeter band? Relates to Alpha. Something Alpha. That, right? Alpha. Yeah, it's, yeah. So don't throw away those old TVs if uh, you ever want to do this. I suspect most of you won't though. How many times per second is a new frame transmitted? Now, if, Alpha. Yeah, it's the complete picture. How many horizontal lines make up a fast scan frame? Surely. 525. Not all of which get used, but that's the right answer. How is an interlaced scanning pattern generated in a fast scan television, television system? An interlaced scanning pattern. Mm. Delta. Delta. Right, you do the odds and then the evens. Some interesting ways to get trapped here if you're not clear on that. What is the name of the signal component that carries color information in NTSC video? Data. Bravo. Bravo. Mm -hmm. Chroma. Which of the following describes the use of vestigial sideband in analog fast scan TV. Bravo. Well, Charlie? the answer Charlie. that you're looking for is Charlie. Vestigial sideband reduces bandwidth. Okay, so in essence, this is asking what are, what are the reasons that they use it? It is true that we use vestigial sideband for uh, well, we don't use it for audio information. It is used for, for chroma, but what they're really asking is what, um, why are the reasons that we're using this in the first place? Reduces bandwidth and allows for simple video de uh, detector circuitry. So now that we've been through that, you won't get caught again. What is vestigial sideband modulation? Alpha. Okay, well, let's let's consider it. Um, it is it is alpha, complete sideband, and a portion of the other are transmitted. Somebody said Charlie. There have been. 
if you will, where you are filtering a sideband, but it's, it's not narrowband FM. It's, a, it, it's amplitude modulation. So if you pick uh, just the wrong words out of some of these questions, you can say, oh, that's it, but it might not be. And then we're going to get into slow scan. Now, you might never have an interest in doing fast scan, um, but slow scan has got the advantage of working on a sideband channel, and you can actually send slow scan on the same transceiver that you're using for everything else. So sl slow scan uh, TV is really within the, the reach and is easily implemented by the average Joe Ham. Now the, the first thing is somewhat of a misconception. Um, slow scan TV really isn't television, it's, it's image transmission. So we're, we're not sending moving pictures, we're just sending still images. So that, that's the first thing to be aware of. And there's two flavors, there's analog and digital versions of slow scan. And here's a picture from the International Space Station. It was downloaded. Some more information about it. And as mentioned, it's just single image transmission. And it's a sound card based software. You can use single sideband on HF or FM on VHF. It's restricted to the phone band segments. If it's restricted to the phone band segments, that should imply a couple of things to you. First of all, it's going to have to fit in a 3 kilohertz um, space, just like single sideband phone would be. Secondly, they're going to have to do pretty much everything with audio tones. And there's multiple pool questions that refer to how do you do this, how do you do that. And the answer is almost always audio tones. So be aware of that as we're moving forward. Approximate bandwidth, 3 kilohertz, so it has to be in a phone segment. And varying tone frequencies are used for brightness, video, and new picture line signals. So again, tone frequencies is going to be the answer to a lot of questions. There's no interlace. We've got one frame per picture. Again, we're not sending any, any moving pictures, just still images. And even back at the time of the Apollo program, NASA was using this technology. And if you go to the uh, link that I had on a previous slide, you can actually uh, get connected with the International Space Station or some of the images that they've sent be online. This picture is just a little bit different. Because we're sending still images, we would have to use a frame grabber in order to get something out of a video. We could use a scanner, could use a still photo out of your camera. This will all come into your computer one way or another. And then there's going to be a sound card interface, which could be internal to the radio, could be inside the computer, obviously an older slide. And that's everything you need. So you've already got an HF radio. You've already got a computer. The, the sound card is probably going to be in the computer or your radio. So you basically have everything that you need to do slow scan TV without having to make any investment. And here's some of the standards. The original versions of the technology could do a frame time of eight seconds. There's a lot of different modes right now that, are, that, that varies all over the place. I'll have a slide showing that. Lines per frame is 120. Pretty different than fast scan. And some various, uh, not, notice that all of this stuff, black frequency, white frequency, bandwidth, um, these are all tone frequencies. Hey Dave, sorry to interrupt. Yep, Just to, okay. um, yeah, we were saying pretty easy to get into slow scan TV. The first time I did it, I literally did it with a ICOM ID51A HT and a laptop. Okay, well that uh, underscores what we were talking about. I, I didn't really expect we'd have anybody in the group here that had actually done that. So I'm, I'm yeah, impressed. we got we have a we have a club um, about thirty miles south of me. Um, Sunday nights they have a, a slow scan TV net that they do through their repeater, mm -hmm. which it's a ton of fun. That's awesome. That's really awesome. And it really helps to get hooked up with some other people that are doing it because uh, that that'll. 
that'll push you along. And then you can share images amongst your local club, local hams. So there's various different modes. There's uh, software, much of it is free, that will handle these modes. There's a uh, robot, Martin, and, and Scotty. And they have different, different flavors, different amount of times to send an image, and different number of lines that, that are sent as part of an image. 128 and 256 are obvious, obviously the most popular. And the, the longer, the bigger ones take longer to send. So here's something that will show up, how color information is sent. Um, color lines are sent sequentially. So they'll actually send, uh, the, some of these modes will send three scans. They'll do a, a red, a green, and blue. They'll, they'll send them one right after the other sequentially. That's what this pull question is getting to. And then those, those will be combined for a, a color image. So each line is sent for in all three of those colors in order to put it back together again. Some of these other modes uh, use different technology to do that, but this is the one that appears in the pool. Some more stuff here for us. Analog. Aspect of analog's closed scan television signal that encodes the brightness of the picture. Well, the same, you know, tone frequencies. Obviously, it's going over a single sideband. Uh, channel. So we're going to be varying tone frequencies over a certain range in order to send that uh, brightness information. Now here's kind of an odd sounding concept, um, a random fact I guess I would call it. The vertical interval signaling code is sent as part of an SSTV transmission or sent as a part of an SSTV transmission is used to identify the SSTV mode being used. If I flip back here, th these are some of the different modes, and they will have uh, individual um, signatures that get sent during this vertical interval signaling period. Vertical interval signaling, that's when the, the, the beam translates from the bottom back to the top and starts scanning again. So it's sent during that period of time. So your specific tone frequencies again are used to signal the SSTV receiving software to begin a new picture line. They have to do all of this with audio tones. And the, this, this was a very instructive link for me, so I wanted to include it. And then we've got DRM. This is digital, digital slow scan TV, based on the Digital Radio Mondial protocol. This is pronounced all different ways, but DRM acceptable bandwidth is 3 kilohertz for voice or slow scan TV, but we're, we're doing it digital. So you, you could do, you could run this um, on your standard HF radio as well. And no other hardware is needed beyond a receiver with single sideband and a computer to decode DRM on a PC. Now DRM um, is a broadcast format and I think they were doing this in Europe is that correct Gary? Well it's um, it was supposed to be the savior for international broadcasting okay as many of you know I worked for the Voice of America for about 20 years and uh, DRM um, allowed you to retrofit old shortwave transmitters to transmit a digital signal um, and uh, some broadcasters were doing it uh, BBC, Deutsche Welle uh, VOA did some limited tests. Um, India has actually adopted a lot of DRM. The big thing was, though, that, okay, we have the international broadcasters transmitting these DRM signals on voice uh, bandwidths. The problem was there were no receivers. Uh. And uh, it was a chicken and egg situation. The receiver mm -hmm. manufacturers weren't going to build receivers until there were a lot of transmissions and the broadcasters weren't going to give you a lot of transmissions until there were receivers. So <laughs> mm -hmm. it never happened. Okay. Well, the, the good thing that came out of that was the, the, the protocols are very usable for, for hams. So that it's an interesting background and history of how we got there, but this is something that's, uh, that's available. EasyPal is one of the, the software packages that will allow you to do this. Do you know of others, Gary? 
No. No. Okay. <laughs> I don't do. I have. You don't do that. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there's a website here where you can download EasyPal and get a lot more information. You can find anything. Google is your friend. So if you're interested in doing this, uh, and and there's tons of uh, YouTube videos on uh, on this as well. And 14.233 is where most of the activity is found. So if, if you get your software and tune your receiver here, you may start decoding images. And there's actually an organization and a website. There's a couple of uh, links that I've added here. So if you want to look into that, you certainly may. So notice we do have a couple of pull questions here. Now, things to be aware of when you're operating slow scan TV, you're running at 100% duty cycle, so the transmitter is uh, going flat out. So if you've got a transmitter, you might have a 100 watt transceiver, but most transceivers are rated at uh, intermittent duty, um, IACS, I believe that's called, intermittent, intermittent amateur commercial service. So if, if they can't handle 100% duty cycle, you'll need to turn the power down a little bit, prevent overheating. Some will work just fine. As with other digital modes, no ALC or speech processing. You want to make sure that um, we're completely linear within the transmitter. No, no noise blanker or DSPN receive. And this is where you can find analog TV on the handbands. So again, with the software, you could tune your receiver here and be decoding. Station ID via picture is legal FCC-wise, but voice ID is recommended in case the listener can't copy the picture. So just kind of a common courtesy thing. So after you send your picture, you might want to say this is Kilo Echo 4 Echo Alpha, just to be legal. You would be anyway, even if you sent it that way, but this, this way everybody would know who you are. Dave, do most... Um Transceivers have the ability, if you're hooked to a computer, to also pick up the mic and talk? Oh, definitely. Yep. Yep. You, you might have to change a setting in, in your software, but you just switch from the, the digital software back to standard single sideband and and uh, and go from there. I see. Okay. Yep. So, what special operating frequency restrictions are imposed on slow scan TV? Charlie. Charlie, yep. They're treated as a, a phone transmission, therefore restricted to the phone band segments. How is color information sent in analog slow scan TV? Alpha. Right, color lines are sent sequentially. That was the one where red, green, and blue were sent one right after another. Not, not all modes, uh, slow scan TV modes, do it that way, but uh, for the purpose of our, that, that, that's what the pool committee was thinking when they came up with this question. What aspects of analog slow scan encodes the brightness of the picture? Mm. Bravo. Uh, well, uh, if you recall, a tone frequency was the one I told you to remember because it'll apply to just about every every time you see one of these. So it, it, it's alpha, actually. It's the, the tone frequency. You know it's some kind of a tone. I guess you could have uh, could have guessed between this one and this one, but tone frequency is the correct answer. What is the function of the vertical interval signaling code sent as part of a SSTV transmission? What are we using oh. that for? Remember Robot and Scotty and all of those? Let's well, ident <laughs> identify the mode being, and when we say the, the mode being used, it's the slow scan TV mode, because there, there are several technologies. So the, you have to, this, this is, uh, when you're using one of those software packages, it's sending this code so that somebody on the other end can figure out what it is you're doing. And then with luck, the software, if it supports all those modes, would recognize it and do your image display. Huh. That that one's a little esoteric. Um, yeah. Or esoteric. What signals slow scan TV receiving software to begin a new picture? 
remember my magic solution to all of these kind of questions. Awesome. Okay. Yep, tone frequencies. A specific tone frequency would be used to, to do that signaling. Which of the following is an acceptable bandwidth for DRM based voice or slow scan TV transmissions? Alpha. 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 Three kilohertz. Yep. Regulator does a voice mode. Three kilohertz. What hardware other than a receiver with SSB capability and a suitable computer is needed to decode SSTV? Delta. No other hardware is needed. So this is something that you can experiment with. And I'm really, really, really excited about the next slide. And I, I think you might be too. Look at that. We're done early. No. Yes. So, How did you do that? Well, that'll finish up chapter eight. Um, and next week, we're going to start one of the most important chapters, I think, in all of the extra. Now, we were all worried about the math in chapter four because it, it was kind of hairy. But once you get through the pool questions, you probably won't use any of that again. But what we're going to talk about next week, antennas and feed lines, that's going to be the bread and butter for the rest of your ham career. So um, I'm really looking forward to Gary's presentation, and that's going to happen over, over two weeks. And then the, the last uh, technical chapter is on propagation. That will also be very useful to you as you go forward as, as a ham. And I'll, I'll be teaching that. We'll be covering that in, in one week. So we've got, what, three, I get, think four more classes plus the review sessions if, if I have the schedule straight. So we, you're, all, you're all doing really, really well in keeping up with us here. And we, we thank you for your participation. So that'll well, you're doing really, really well. Let's say the truth. Oh, all right. Well, I appreciate the, the feedback, certainly. Um, I marvel. Any other, marvel. Any other questions from the group? If not, we'll go ahead and close down, and you can use your extra 20 minutes for listening on the air if you care to. Thanks to everyone, and uh, thanks to the folks in the chat. Uh, yes. I was not able to get back to you on the chat tonight because I was switching tonight. I'm yeah. back over here, yeah. and so it was kind of keeping me busy. So um, next week, uh, Dave will be on the chat, so you can bug him. Right, right. Yeah, I'll, I'll help you as best <laughs> I can. Unless we don't have a video switcher, then I might have to learn that quick, too. So we'll go from there. All right. Well, good good night, everyone, and and thanks good for night. for being Thank such you, a good night. Happy to you. Bye, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Yep.